Hi, John McClendon. Good morning, Glendora. <laughs> How nice that the man at Sitco said we could sit at his picnic table and discuss the Bible. Yes, yeah, it's very nice of him. How about chapter 11, Matthew? You like that one? Sure. Of all of God's word. <laughs> you like them all, right? Amen. You have a new friend here, John. Yeah. Somebody who she's adores lovely. you. <laughs> yeah, she loves you. Oh, she thinks you're so wonderful, John. What does Jesus say to us in chapter 11? Matthew. Well, he's given reference to uh, John the Baptist and also unto himself. Oh, yes, right. I want to hear that. Because as we know, John the Baptist his whole purpose of his life was to be the forerunner of Christ. That's right. And he, his statement, you got to love it, he says, the one that was after me was before me. <laughs> and you know, I think some people might not catch what he really means by that, but he, Jesus came after him in a physical way. He said, I believe John the Baptist beat him by a, uh, maybe like three months or something. Yes, like that, right. And then, but really, Jesus was, you know, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one that was and is and is yet to come. So he's the eternal God. And so that's why he was before John. He was way before John the Baptist. <laughs> right after Jesus saw John the Baptist, Jesus began his ministry. Yes, he was baptized too, by John yes. the Baptist. And of course, uh, he, he gave us a greater baptism than John the Baptist. He was more than just the baptism of water. He was the baptism through the power of the Holy Spirit. Which really is a, a, another whole added dimension. Because, you know, now we, we can have the mind of Christ. <laughs> yes. Because without that, you can't. John the Baptist said a very simple, really unison message, repent. Amen. It's simple, it's so hard to do, apparently. <laughs> well, uh, so good morning, folks. This is uh, John and Glendora, uh, John McClendon, uh, 103 Daniels Avenue, Pittsfield, Mass. Uh, telephone 413. 441-6774 and I take the full responsibility for this film. Thank uh, you, John. We're in uh, Matthew 11 here. And it says, uh, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And it's interesting that John the Baptist is perhaps the most well-informed of all men. <laughs> well, I would ask this question. So it just shows how weak we are. To the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I think that's an example of this. You know, doubt can can uh, come in even to the greatest believer. You know, it just has a way of trying to get us, get our mind off uh, the certainties of things. And so Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and shoo, shoo John again those things which ye do hear and see. See, the Lord knows that we're, we're going to have doubts and, and things, so, you know, Thomas. And he has a way of reinforcing uh, truth in us believers. And so that's why oftentimes in his word he repeats the same 
statement and the same ideas and the same principles because he knows that we need the reinforcement. Do you know why history repeats itself, John? Nobody was listening. See, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. See, that's the Lord encouraging John to keep believing. And, you know, I like that part where Jesus said um, unto some people, uh, fine, you don't believe in me and, and you want to reject me, and they, okay, but you know, at least, so he gives them a starting point, he says, at least believe in my work, you know, look what I do, why do you think it is that I do the things that I do, you know, I'm healing people that are blind, and people that are deaf, these are good things, at least start, start somewhere, start that, start right with that, you know, the, the that's a good thing, don't you agree? I mean, if you were blind, wouldn't you want to be able to see? If you were lame, wouldn't you want to be able to walk? And if that happened to you, that would be a good thing, right? So at least start there and, and believe in my works. And then once you start believing my works, you'll come to know the knowledge of me, who does these works. And, and so I love how Christ puts it to us, even in our unbelieving state, he gives us a starting point an opportunity yeah. to begin to uh, comprehend uh, what it's all about, yeah. you know? It's wonderful. <laughs> John, I thought this edition would be, this is the New English. Okay, sure. it's, oh no, it's a Bible for you. What's it called? Um, the, yeah, the New Living English. What's it called? I'm trying to find Matthew. New what? English Bible, this, yeah. Yeah, this is a, uh, a more suitable translation for us. So, uh, uh, verse 7, the boss says he believes in reincarnation. He says, did you ever notice at 5 p.m. everybody comes back to life? So when the messengers were on the way back, Jesus began to speak to the people about John. What was the spectacle that drew you to the wilderness? A, re a reed bed swept by the wind? No. Then what did you go out to see? A man dressed in silks and satins? Surely you must look in palaces for that. But why did you go out to see a prophet? And I love this. He says, yes, indeed, and far more than a prophet. Because there are prophets, you know, he's not the only one. Uh, but he is the man of whom scripture says. In other words, the Lord's really going to get specific here and say, what, what specific prophet is this man? Here is my herald, whom I send on ahead of you. And he will prepare your way before you. And isn't that exactly what John said? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, I prepare the way for him. And, uh, it, you know, it's all about letting people know the Messiah is at hand. I tell you this, never was there appeared on earth a mother's son greater than John the Baptist. That's quite a statement. Oh. And yet, the least in the, and then he puts it in true perspective. And even though he's the best of the best, he isn't worthy to be compared to the eternal weight of glory that we're going to see. Because, again, he's still flesh and blood. And that it's not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he'll have to be transformed, just like us, John the Baptist. Uh, when Christ comes back, we know that John the Baptist is in the ground. So he's going to be one of those first ones that meet Jesus in the air. And he'll be transformed in, in, in a twinkling of an eye, in the sound of a trump. And yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. See? And that's the reason for it. Because that's that 
perfect state that Christ sees us in. That when we're transformed, when Christ comes back at a second coming. Uh, right now, you know, um, we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And when that happens, we'll, we'll have our, our full citizenship of heaven. <laughs> I love it. Amen. I love it. So, and that's our great hope, you know, that, that we won't have any aches and pains and sorrows, uh, any weakness of the flesh anymore, because it will be, you know, like the, the angels, so if we have that heavenly body, and, you know, if they're strong and they're fast, we'll have that ability like the angels. Ever since, you know, going through a wall won't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> You won't have to ride your bicycle. Yeah. Ever you can since, fly. You can fly. Amen. Ever since the coming of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent men are seizing I hate it. That's right. That's so true. 2,000 years ago, God, uh, Jesus said that. Ever since the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been subject to violence. Yeah, and they kill the prophets all the day long. And, you know, I feel that because, you know, this world comes against me Stop. so much. Violent. And I'll just be walking down the street minding my own business. And they, they just come out of everywhere. And they, you know, it's amazing. The Christian Center had a seminar on stopping violence. Okay, I thought I saw a shirt on that. Yep. Stop violence. Violence not only people to people, but people to animals, and animals to animals. Mm -hmm. Stop it, you violent dog. <laughs> For all the prophets in the law foretold things to come until John appeared. And John is the destined Elijah, if you will but accept it. If you have ears that can hear, then hear. And you know, that's, that's Old Testament of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet that, that was his catchphrase. If anyone who has an ear, let him hear. And, uh, and you'll see that in, in, in God's word, certain people have certain catchphrases. It kind of uh, uh, marks who they are. Wasn't it Joshua that said, far be it from me? He kept saying that, that phrase, far be it from me. <laughs> Joshua said, as for me and my family, we shall serve the Lord. the Lord. Yes, that's right. Joshua 24. Yeah. So how can I describe this generation? They are like the children sitting in the marketplace and shouting at each other. We piped for you, and you would not dance. We wept and wailed, and you would not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he is possessed. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drinker, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners, and yet God's wisdom is proved right by its results. And you know, folks, doesn't matter how bad you are, Jesus can help you change and you might get scoffed at but that's okay and then he spoke of the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed and denounced them for their impenitence alas for you Chorazin he said alas for you Bethsaida if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would long ago have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable, I tell you, for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And as for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to the skies? No, brought down to the depths. For if the miracles have been performed in Sodom, 
which were performed in you, Sodom would be standing to this day. But it will be more bearable, I tell you, for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. See, Jesus is saying, I'm right here, right in front of you. No longer am I a, a far off idea that's been predicted through the ages uh, of my coming, the Messiah. I, I'm right here, right before you. I'm walking with you, I'm talking with you, I'm showing and demonstrating the mighty power of the kingdom of heaven. And so that you truly, truly have no excuse. And if you don't receive me, it's, it's the greatest shame. You know, it'd be like if I said, you know, tomorrow I'm going to come and I'm going to visit you. And then as each second of the clock ticks, and then each minute and each hour until tomorrow is all a witness to me. All my prophets are preparing and saying and reminding you on TV and in the newspapers that John's coming tomorrow uh, and he'll show up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon get ready for it. It's a big event. And... And, and all of these things are witness to you of the coming and then tomorrow comes and, and you know you don't show up and, and I was supposed to come to help you and, and you claim that you need help but you don't receive it that, that, it's that kind of witness against you uh, you've had all this preparation the law and the prophets and, 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 and then I'm right here showing up and, and you don't come and I told you to come so that, that, it's that kind of example. That it's so sad to miss it. To miss a great opportunity. It's so sad to miss it. Tell people how they go about it. Tell them how they go about it. It's, it's, as, it's as simple as humbling yourself and just saying, you know, Lord God, I need you. You're the one who can help me. Uh, man can't help me. He might be helpful at times. He, he isn't steady. He's, he's, he's a shake, shaky guy, man. But you, you're, you're, you're God Almighty. And I need that power. I need that kind of help. Uh, the one that can change the impossible. And we all need that, folks. You know, because you can't rely on man. I mean, even brother will turn against brother itself. So we're all going to let each other down. But God won't let us down. He'll help us. I got it, John. Listen to me. I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Amen. So that's all you have to do is just come to him and ask him for his help. And he promises that he will help you. Isn't that wonderful Isn't that, that he wonderful? promises it? Yeah. Man will say, oh, I'll help you, I'll help you. And then, you know, you, you're waiting for him to help you, and he doesn't show up to help you. Yeah. And you still end up doing the job yourself. Yeah. So, but with God, he, he'll show up, he'll help you. So, he's a very present help. Very in present In time help. of need. So, and, John says, humble yourself and say, God, I need you. Amen. Is that what you said? That, that's basically all it is. Is that it? That's it? Yeah. And you say, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to continue doing things my own way. Um, kind of, I can see how it doesn't work. Uh, but show me, show me the better way. Show me, show me how I can live my life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And, and I want to get to the Father. And the only way to do that is through you, Jesus. So help me, Lord God. Help me do that. At that time, Jesus spoke these words. I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for hiding these things from the learned and wise and revealing them to the simple. See how the Lord works? The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Yes, Father, such was thy choice. Everything is entrusted to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son but the Father. No one knows the Father but the Son, 
and those to whom the Son may choose to reveal. See, so unless you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't be saved. And I can't be saved. That's how you come to know the Father. Jesus says, me and, and the Father are the same. We're, we're... we're one. Come to me, all whose work is hard, who shall go in his heaven, and I will give you relief. Well, we all need relief, don't we? Indeed. Bend your necks to my yoke, and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble-hearted, and your souls will find relief. For my yoke is good to bear, and my load is light. You know, this is true, folks. Uh, sometimes it might feel like the yoke is really heavy, and it's unbearable, and you say, how, how can I do this? How can I get through it? But, you know, that's just the feeling. And we have to realize the truth is true. Uh, it may feel a certain way, but you don't go by feeling. You, you know, magicians are famous for that. They, they cause illusions, right? Oh, and they indeed. say, oh, this looks like it disappeared. Well, come on. Okay, the elephant, didn't, you know, it's trickery. And, and the devil will make us believe in lies, try to make us believe in lies, and just because it feels or looks a certain way. But we have to realize truth. That's why I always remind myself when I say, you know, I can't bear these things. It, it, it just, it's too heavy for me. And then I, I say, no, I, 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 I reject those words. Actually, I am able to bear them. Not on my own power. But God said that I'm able to bear them. So I believe it. Lord, give me the strength I need to bear this. And thank you that the, the load is light. It doesn't feel light, but you say it's light. So... I, I agree with you that it, this is just a light burden. It really is, folks. All of us put together, all of our sorrows put together, doesn't measure up to the sorrow that the Christ for, for us. So in that sense, there's a truth right there in the Revelation. He, he bore all the sins of the world. So do you think that just your, your <coughs> sorrows that you bear is anything compared to all the sorrows? In all the sin of the world. You see that picture? So, of course it's light compared to our Lord. And that's why he says that truth, because he's true. So he says, your burden it is light. Okay. Because I bore the sins of the world. So your, your burden is really out of light. I've made them light for you. It's just a wonderful truth. Um... Yeah, so that was all of chapter 11. It didn't seem like it went through 30 verses, but okay. Well, that Boy, that, that, that one went fast, huh? Yes, that was good, and thank you, John. Uh, I think before we start chapter 12, we've got two or three minutes. Okay. And I wanted to tell, talk to the folks about self-conquest. Uh, before conquest of others. I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Self-conquest? Yeah, Conque con conquer yourself before you start conquering others. What do you have to say about oh, that? Oh, yeah, that, that's an interesting concept. Um, you know, <coughs> the flesh always wants to have its own way. And the thing about being a citizen of heaven being saved, is, is that God teaches you how to harness yourself and, and yoke yourself to Him and, and let Him control you, and and how to have self, practice self-control. Conquer and, yourself. Yeah, and, and, you know, instead of me wanting to bring up my arm in response, you know, because some of us want to do that. Uh, you know, we want to bring our arms up or find a way to our own solution to the problem instead of relying on truth and what the, what the Spirit would lead us into. And so we, we learned that, you know, violence isn't a good way to solve problems. Um, us uh, uh, being real voiceful and trying to 
to have a shouting match or, or whatever the situation would be, we find a better way, a, a, a more peaceful way. Sometimes it's just sitting there and letting a person yell at you and, and you say nothing, you don't respond. Uh, like our Lord himself, he, he opened not his mouth. What an example for us. You know, that takes power. Because sometimes it can be real hard, even for a seasoned veteran, to just sit there under extreme measures and, and not get defensive and, and, and give a, a worthy explanation. It could be a worthy explanation, but not even get that. Because the scripture also tells us we don't throw our pearls to swine. You know what? If you try to give them the right answer, they're not going to receive it anyway. So you're just wasting your breath. So you must just sit there. And God has such great wisdom. Just, just sit there, let them get their steam off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow them to do that. And you'll be a perfect witness for them. You'll show what the kingdom of heaven is like. And, and you know, that person might not get it right away. But maybe 10 years down the road, they'll remember your character. And say, you know, I remember when I lost my cool. And it was probably over something stupid. Yeah. Now that's what I did. I used to always lose my cool. And then they'll remember that. And they'll, they'll, they'll see the character of God and receive it then. So. Good, good word for that, John, is self-possession. You lost your self-possession. Oh, I like that. Yes. You like that? Well, John, would you tell the folks again uh, all those things that you have to say? Well, we... We have to just say that we're sorry to God for all our sins, and, and there's more than we could ever imagine. I mean, the sin debt is, is a great debt, uh, but the good news, yeah, the gospel the of Jesus Christ, is that we, we can, no matter how big the debt, can be forgiven. And That's He wants to forgive us for yeah, it. Yeah, focus on the joy. So just, just ask for His forgiveness. That's all it is. Repentance means I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to and get away from that. And, and clean up my debts. Be debt free. And, and have the kingdom of heaven. So that uh, I'll be in glory forever. <laughs> and even though I die, I really won't die. So that, that's wonderful. Be resurrected. John, tell him that you take full responsibility for our show. Yeah, so once again, this is Glenn Dora and John McClendon, 103 Daniels Avenue, uh, phone number 441-6774, and I take full responsibility for the making of this. And we hope that if you don't have salvation, that you, you would uh, consider it and receive it today. Whee! Time is running out, folks. Now, if you sit over here, we'll know when the second one begins. Okay. When I can see that without the audio. Okay. Now, was that about right, John? Yes. Let me go look at it. Okay. So just keep it running. Yeah, and I'll hold this up to where you're sitting. This is about where you can sit it. Oh yeah, we had to change it a little. All right. Is that better? That's a good, that yes, good. that's a good signal. Good. All right, let's go. Ooh. Don't move, John. <laughs> can you get back to where you yep. were? Yep. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's better looking than mine. Okay, let me get a time on this. We're starting at 8.40. Or is it 9.40? 9. And then so we'll be through at 9.07, right? Yep. Okay. 10.07. Excuse me. Okay, 5, 4, 3, 2, Good morning, folks. Uh, chat with Glenn Dora. My name is John McClendon, uh, 103 Daniels Avenue, Pittsfield, Mass. Uh, phone 413 441 
6774 and I take full responsibility for the making of this film. Um, and we're starting uh, Matthew 12. And it says, Once about that time, Jesus took a walk on the Sabbath through the cornfields. And his disciples, feeling hungry, began to pluck some ears of corn and eat them. You know, what some people don't realize is that, and this is an old biblical principle, um, when you planted uh, a field, you would actually uh, preserve a certain portion of the outside. And that, that was a, a, a common practice uh, so that you would allow the poor access your field to actually come in and, 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 and they practice that. Ooh, nice. And, and yeah, nice. they criticized them for the practices that they even set up. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> their, their hypocrisy is so deep when they criticize the Lord. It's funny. So the Pharisees noticed this. Yeah, they're very, they notice everything. They're sharp guys. We're trying to find something <laughs> wrong. Yeah. And said to him, look, there's an accusation. Look! Pointing their fingers, I can just see them. Look! Your disciples are doing something which is forbidden on the Sabbath. I, you know, if I was Jesus, I'd be tempted to be a wise guy. I'd say something like, well, you got to look that up and give me a reference. Where does it say that? <laughs> Show me the point a lot. Is that chapter? What, what, what subtitle? And all State that? your statutory authority. <laughs> What yeah, is your statutory authority? You know, penal code, <laughs> numbers. <laughs> so he answered, but he didn't. He didn't do that like John might be tempted to do that. And have you not read what David did when he and his men were hungry? He went into the house of God and ate the consecrated loaves. Though neither he nor his men had a right to eat them, but only the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath, and it is not held against them? I tell you, there is something greater than the temple here. If you had known what the text means, I require mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is sovereign over the Sabbath. And I'm not sure he says it here, but he also makes a statement somewhere. He says that uh, this man wasn't created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for man. So you're kind of getting it backwards there. You know, uh, the Sabbath was created so that you would have a time of rest. Lord is wisdom knew that the weak state that we're in uh, will need rest. So that's why he created it. And we should be thankful that he created the Sabbath so that we have a time to rest. And he, you know, the earth. He said, you know, you plant for six days, or six years, I'm sorry, and then the seventh year is kind of a Sabbath for the earth. And then you let the earth rest and then it recovers, the soil nutrients are replaced. But now what we do is we just keep going. Your 24-7 uh, stores are open all the time and there's no rest. And we just keep planting and we don't give the earth a year off. We just keep planting and planting and planting. And then 20 years down the road, we realize, oh, we missed uh, three Sabbaths. And you wonder why the ground's all worn out and won't produce. That's the reason why, folks. You know, I want to just say here that I always make sure that my compost, my organic, anything that's left over organic, that I put it uh, back into the soil to uh, replace what I've taken out of the soil. Mm -hmm. Boy, we need to do a whole lot more of that. Yeah, yeah save your organic things and make sure you put it in the soil someplace. He went on to another place 
Now wait, isn't that where they never asked him a question again? After his answer was so good? Isn't it from that point on they never asked him a question again? Is that where it is? It doesn't say that here. Well, somewhere so, later, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, he went on to another place and entered their synagogue. A man was there with a withered arm. And they asked Jesus, is it permitted to heal on the Sabbath? It, it, at least they're asking questions. That's good, you know. You don't understand, folks. Ask questions. Well, they have a bad motive for asking questions. They're trying to trick him. Right. At least he, the Lord will still answer foolish questions and he'll still get truth. And their aim was to frame a charge against them. Yeah. But he said to them, suppose he had one sheep which fell into a ditch on the Sabbath. And there is one of you who would not catch it. Is there one of you who would not catch hold of it and lift it out? In other words, of course he would. In other words, he's actually saying, you, you've done this. He's being subtle and he's saying, I, I've seen you yourselves do this. Because they do. <laughs> you, you need your sheep. You need your oxen. That's how you, you live your... People need uh, these to live their lives. You know, oxen is like us having an automobile. You lose your automobile, you know, you're not going to try to save your automobile. Of course you're not. And surely a man is worth far more than a sheep. It is therefore permitted to do good on the Sabbath. Turning to the man, he said, stretch out your arm. So the man with the withered arm stretched it out, and it was made sound again like the other one. Oh, I think that's wonderful. It, oh, that's, that's no, I'd great. Like, I'd love to do that. But the Pharisees, on leaving, leaving the synagogue, laid a plot to do away with him. See, he, he heals a man, and they want to kill him. Yeah. It's amazing. You know it's why? He's amazing. a friend to them. Yep. He's right, they're wrong. Yeah. you yeah. got four eyes. One, two, two, three. <laughs> four eyes. That's what he called Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. He wore glasses. Jesus was aware of it and withdrew. And I, I love that because... <laughs> yeah. He, like, he didn't he, fall for it. Yeah. <laughs> He wasn't aware of things. That's why he's the Lord. Many followed, and he cared all who were cured, all who were ill. And he gave strict injunctions that they were that they were not to make him known. This was in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen. My beloved, on whom my favor rests, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim judgment among the nations. He will not strive, he will not shout, nor will his voice be heard in the streets. He will not snap off the broken reed, nor snuff out the smoldering wick, until he leads justice on to victory. In him the nations shall place their hope. I, boy, I love that. You know? mm. Love those old prophecies of Joel and uh, Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where the, the, the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Oh, and they brought him a man who was possessed. He was blind and dumb, and Jesus cured him, restoring both speech and sight. The bystanders were all amazed, and the word went around. Can this be the son of David? Absolutely, you got it. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, prince of devils, that this man drives the devils out. And you know, it's such a silly statement, uh, you know, accusing him of being the devil. That was someone he created. They're scared. They're scared yeah. he's taking over. So he knew what was in their minds. 
So we said to them, every kingdom divided against itself goes to ruin. And no town, no household that is divided against itself can stand. And if it is Satan who casts out Satan, Satan is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if it is by Beelzebub that I cast out devils, by whom do your own people drive them out? If this is your argument, they themselves will refute you. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out the devils, then be sure the kingdom of God has already come upon you. And again, this just speaks uh, as a witness against them, um, let alone the silly arguments and stuff. But the actual authority. Or again, how can anyone break into a strong man's house and make off with his goods unless he has first tried, tied the strong man up before ransacking the house? He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, no sin no slander is beyond forgiveness for men, except slander spoken against the Spirit, and that will not be forgiven. Any man who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but if anyone speaks against the Holy Spirit, for him there is no forgiveness, either in this age or in the age to come. See, so you want to accuse the Holy Spirit of not being real. You know, it's the only way we can do anything is by the power of the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't want to do that. No. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad, make the tree bad and its fruit bad. You, you can tell a tree by its fruit. You vipers brood, how can your words be good when you yourselves are evil? For the words that the mouth utters come from the overflowing of the heart. A good man produces good from the store of good within himself, oh, and an good. evil man from the evil within produces evil. Oh, I'd like to say that again. The good man... Yep. Say A good again. man produces good from the store of good within himself. Yeah. And, and again, that's us. Uh, once we have salvation, we become good. Not that we're good of ourselves, but God imputes righteousness and good to us. John, I've written that out in big letters. The truth that mortal conduct grows naturally out of personal holiness. Let me read it again. The truth that mortal conduct grows naturally out of personal holiness. Read that again about the good man. A good man produces good from the store of good within himself. See, and God does that. He places a well. He says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. And so the, another picture for us is that good man produces good from the store of good within himself. He said God places that in us. That, and that's whereby we operate our faith from too. Yeah. Faith is a wonderful gift from God which he gave every man his own portion. And it's just so wonderful. <laughs> but these people are going around and they're, they're just misusing. Well, you forget that. They're misplacing their faith. The truth that mortal conduct grows naturally out of personal holiness. Personal holiness. Talk yes. to me about personal holiness. Just let every man work out his salvation with fear and trembling. So, uh, you, you know, you have to work it out. And your personal holiness is is uh, worrying about your own affairs. Let every man be concerned about his own affairs. And not being a busybody and worrying and pointing his fingers and saying, look, look, you're, you're eating in the cornfield on the Sabbath. And, Oh, you shouldn't be doing this, and you shouldn't be doing... Oh, and you, you can't do this, and you gotta do this. 
That's what we said <laughs> earlier. Self conquest before conquest of others. Yeah. Yeah. Examine yourself. Self conquest. You start worrying about yourself. And, and, and start getting the logs out of your own eye so you can see better if you get removed those, those, those little splinters there in your brother's eye. You know, once you start doing truth, we'll know how to operate better and really have understanding about how to do things. So I tell you this, there is not a thoughtless word that comes from men's lips, but they will have to account for it on the day of judgment. I'll say that again. It's not a thoughtless word that comes from men's lips, but they will have to account for it on the day of judgment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's okay. We'll work through it. Go get your long For out of your own mouth you will be acquitted. Out of your own mouth you will be condemned. Yeah. See, so you have to give an account someday, folks. Yeah. So let your words be seasoned, he says. Let them be, your lips be salted. Um, you know, if you ain't got nothing, here's another worldly statement, but if you ain't got anything good to say, then don't say nothing. You don't. should keep your lips uh, uh, sealed and, you know. And Romans 12, 14 says, for every one of us shall give an account of himself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. Now, have we gone into another chapter? No, 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 no. We're still in yeah, chapter we're what? we're still there, yeah. We're chapter only about halfway through. Of yeah. what? Which chapter? Twelve, yeah. At this, some of the doctors of the law and the Pharisees said, Master, we should like you to show us a sign. <laughs> sure they were. Yeah. So he answered, it is a wicked, godless generation that asks for a sign. You know, folks, he's been given signs and wonders throughout every age. <laughs> you know, Romans 1.20, look around by the evidence of things clearly seen. The heavenly bodies and the formations, you know, the, the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper and, the, you know, and all the things, I mean, Come on. <laughs> well, those are really illusions, John. Right, but the... Uh, no, just illusions, that's what... He, he made those. Yeah, well, he made them all. And there is a certain pattern. So he, he, he set it up that way for us to look at. And the only sign that will be given it is the sight, is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was in the sea monster's belly for three days and three nights. And in the same way, Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth. And, you, you know, a lot of people don't get that. But uh, he's just saying, I'm going to be resurrected. Why? Because I'm the resurrection and the life. So, I, I love it. <laughs> At the judgment, when this generation is on trial... Let me say that again for emphasis. At the judgment, there's going to be a judgment, folks. When this generation is on trial, it surely will be. We shall all surely stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In Corinthians, it says that. The men of Nineveh will appear against it as a witness against it and ensure its con condemnation. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And what is here is greater than Jonah. Again, just like John the Baptist that we alluded to in chapter 11. Before forewarning. Just like I said, if I am going to be here tomorrow at a certain time, and then there's a newspaper article on it, you see it on the TV, it's on the radio. People were walking around telling everybody, holding up signs, hey, you know, he's coming, he'll be here tomorrow, you got to show up, and you really got to listen to this guy. And, and then the time comes and you, you don't come. You, know. you had plenty of opportunity, you could have come. Can't say you didn't hear about it, that's, that's not true, but 
that we, no one's not heard about Jesus. He's made himself known to everyone. So, that's a lie. The Queen of the South will appear at the judgment when this generation is on trial and ensure its condemnation. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And what is here is greater than Solomon. So again, the Lord is comparing, you know, and if they could listen to them, <laughs> you know, how much more should you be listening to me, who is far greater than all put together? That's basically what he's saying. You know, they listen to them. So, again, when an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it wanders over the desert seeking a resting place and finding none it says I will go back to the home I left so it returns and finds the house unoccupied swept clean and tidy off it goes and collects seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they all come in and settle down and in the end the man's plight is worse than before. And, you know, if you don't understand that, it's just a simple uh, uh, concept of numbers. He comes back with seven other spirits. So, you can imagine it's going to be worse. You just got one spirit and you're not doing too good. Well, imagine if you bring seven and they're all worse than himself. <laughs> oh, but, but can't we get rid of the unclean spirit and be clean and no more come back into us? We sure can. That's all of the kingdom of heaven is available. You can have a withered hand. You can have evil spirits inside. You can have all manner of things. But Christ can solve every problem. And that is how it will be for this wicked generation. You know, you're just going to get worse. And he says that. And things are going to wax worse and worse. You think we're going to get worse and worse? I thought we were going to get better and better. Uh, that comes later. <laughs> <coughs> he was still speaking to the crowd when his mother and brothers appeared. They stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone said, your mother and your brothers are here outside. We want to speak to you. Jesus turned to the man who brought the message and said, who is my mother? Yeah. And who are my brothers? This is really interesting. Yeah. And pointing to the disciples, he said, Here are my mo mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my heavenly Father is my brother, my sister, and my mother. See, folks, this is how much he cares for us. That he came, he left heaven, a glorious place, humbled himself, became one of us, flesh and blood, and he didn't really override that. Uh, you know, he had the power to, but he, he suffered, he bore uh, uh, pain, he, he sweat, he cried, he suffered like we do, and became one of us and, and just showed us that he loved us. And he included us almost on the same level with himself. He said, you're my brother, and you're my sister, and you're my mother. And he hugged us, and he kissed us, and he touched us, and he healed us. And, and, and he showed us how important we are to him. You know, um, and it's not a slight. It's not a slight to his, his, his um, uh, earthly uh, relations. You know, Mary and Joseph, his father and his brother James, and his other brothers. Um, it's not a slight to them. Uh, he's just saying that my family is bigger than just my my natural family. You know, uh, me, I had two families, and, and I didn't know how blessed I was. Uh, I was concerned about just being taken away from my natural family um, and put in an orphanage and then a foster family. And, and was tough, but I, I come to realize how blessed I am now, and now, <laughs> actually my testimony of being a citizen of heaven, 
is that I have a much even greater family than just those two families. So I'm really blessed. <laughs> I'm part of this <laughs> heavenly family. Yeah, that's nice. And it, it's just so wonderful. It's, the, folks, the picture is so much bigger than we can possibly comprehend. That's why the scripture says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of man the things that God has in store for those who love him. See, so folks, when we get there, it's going to get so much better than we can even imagine. You, you know, it, it, we just can't comprehend it. We see through a gap, glass darkly right now. But, but then we shall know, even as we are known, which is completely. Um, so yeah, so that that's really the message right there, is that the family of God is really big. In fact, he says that, um, that the, 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 the number of heaven is, is, is uh, this is as the sands of the seashore. So that's quite a quite a big number. Because the sands of the seashore, well, if you if anybody would care to count the, the grains of sand on a beach, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I think that we have to go now. Yep, we got a couple minutes. So. No we don't. We don't we have to go now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, once again, folks, it's a chat with Glendora, and my name is John McClendon, and 103 Daniels Avenue, Pittsfield, Mass., telephone 413-441-6774, and, and I take full responsibility for the making of this film. Lord bless. That's so good, John. Now, that was wonderful. This Averio isn't as like the other Averio. The other Averio would give you two hours and a half. So we have to go charge this at the man's electricity and put up another camcorder. Okay. All righty. And buy the doggy something. Yeah, I don't know if.